Oh yeah, here I was gonna show you. So Africa. Kind of. This is one of history's craziest almost moments that you've probably never heard of. The plan was called the Uganda Scheme, and it was presented to the World Zionist Congress in 1903 by Theodore Herzl, widely regarded as the father of political Zionism. The plan would have created a Jewish homeland in East Africa. You might be wondering, why East Africa? Well so that was the other proposed country besides Palestine was in uh, Uganda, I believe. Well, like many Africa. places in the world at the time, it was under the colonial control of the British Empire. European colonizers came into East Africa and did what colonizers do. Displace, dehumanize, subjugate, murder, the list goes on. But thousands of miles away, Europe was becoming an increasingly hostile environment for Jews. In fact, in 1903, Jews in Eastern Europe faced a terrible and bloody massacre. Jews were desperate. So when Britain offered to partner with the Zionists to establish a Jewish homeland in present day Kenya, it was appealing. So the Sixth Zionist Congress convenes in August of 1903, and Herzl calls on the 473 delegates to vote on this plan. And it passes easily, even though some hated it and many saw it as a temporary solution. But this is where it gets interesting. In the end, the Uganda scheme never came to fruition, in large part because the white settlers in East Africa believed that it would be unfair to them to be displaced by settlers. They established an anti-Zionist immigration committee and published their disapproval in a local newspaper, causing Britain to withdraw their offer to the Zionists. All of this makes me wonder what the world would look like today if the Jewish homeland was anywhere else, or if the Palestinian people were white. So it's, you know, that's an interesting thing too, is like, the only thing stopping Israel being in Kenya right now is like other white people, <laughs> you know, being afraid of <laughs> being displaced from their uh, yeah, he has nothing to do with colony. <laughs> you know, so it's Crazy it's really, uh, and you know, I don't mean for this to be like, oh, white people bad. You know, I don't believe in that. But it's like the you have to look at the history, well, you know, it's like, they're not bad because they're white. It's like those specific white people were bad. Uh, but, you know, you have to like thread that, you know, or like, uh, what do you call it? Thread the needle all the way to, you know, see that these are the same kind of ideologies happening over there. Um, so we were kicked out of Catholic Yeah, so I these are kind of, I was talking about... Um, because when we were kicked out of Catholic Spain in 1492, when we were kicked out of Catholic Portugal, I think in 1503, it was the Muslims who took the Jews in. That's why there are Jewish communities in the Islamic world till this very day. The Islamic community, the Jewish community of Istanbul dates from then. Um, it, was, it was specifically um, countries uh, not beyond the Ottoman Empire where Jews were tolerated uh, and they were welcomed in. And they, they, played, they paid a jizya. There was a poll tax they paid, but they were never persecuted. And there wasn't a whole because. Yeah, so, you know, that was kind of going back to what I was saying earlier about Jews in the Muslim world and you know, the, the tax that he's talking about, too, is basically um, in Islam, you, there's like a, one of the main pillars of faith is zakat, which is every year you have to give 2.5% of your net worth to the poorest uh, people um, in the community or, you know, in your city or country or whatever. Uh, and so it's like a, kind of like a UBI and uh, like a, a wealth tax to disincentivize hoarding capital. Um, so instead of like income tax, it's like a wealth tax and, you know, throughout history, actually, there was never any poverty in the Muslim world because of this. Um, so that 2.5% tax, uh, was, you know, every Muslim is obligated to pay that, but the Jews and the Christians living in that society that, uh, you know, it wasn't in their faith to pay that tax. They, you know, because the state itself was a, the Muslim state. They then require them to pay that same 2.5%, not as zakat, because zakat isn't a part of Judaism and Christianity, but, um, you know, so that everyone's on the same playing field in terms of the, uh, like, taxation towards public goods, or not necessarily public goods, but directly as, like, UBI to the poorest, you know, percentage of the population. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, so here's another one, too. Um, in terms of like saying that this is about people like hating Jews or or all that, this is like uh, this is the founder of Hamas and like a statement he made of why Hamas is doing what they're doing. I'll read this out in case people are uh, listening, so uh, or not watching the video. So uh, we don't hate the Jews and fight them because they're Jews. Let me turn the volume down on. A little bit. 
We don't hate Jews and fight them because they're Jews. Jews are people of a religion and we are people of a religion. We love all people from different religions. My brother, even if he is my brother and he is a Muslim, if he steals my house and kicks me out, I will resist him. I would resist my brother or cousin if they took my land and house and kicked me out. So when a Jew takes my land and a house and kicks me out, I'm also ready to resist him. I don't fight America or Britain or other countries. I am peaceful with all people. I love all people and wish good for everyone. I also wish good for Jews. Jews have lived with us throughout their lives and we have never attacked them. We have never treated them badly and they have reached high positions in ministries among us. But when they steal my house and my land and kick me out, and that was the end of that clip. But, um, you know, so mainstream media will tell you Hamas just like hates Jews and they're Nazis. Um, you know, like Nazis had nothing to do with Palestinians. Like there's no, uh, and it's hilarious too. And some of the Israeli propaganda, they like went into one of the schools and they showed uh, like a picture or like they showed a book of uh, Mein Kampf in Arabic. And they're like, oh, this is what they're teaching kids. And it was literally just like they made that cover, like they got someone to Photoshop this thing and to like put this idea forward that Palestinians have anything to do with German ethno supremacy. Uh, and so it's again like that is used to like invoke the Holocaust. And, um, you know, there's a. Uh, there's a this guy who makes really good, uh, like short video clip or short like skits on uh that really kind of paint the picture clearly what's going on when you just re recontext it but essentially like the holocaust being used as like a political leverage to like get away with all this stuff which actually like that's probably one of the most anti-semitic things you can do is like use the suffering of the jewish people as like a political leverage to commit more suffering against like a different group of people um that's like dishonoring the memory of those people suffering from the Holocaust more than anything else. But yeah, it's luscious. Dude, what the hell are you doing? Defending myself? What's it to you? You're gonna kill him. Oh my God. Why do you hate all followers of my faith so much? What's happening? You criticizing me means you hate me and all adherence to my religion. I couldn't care less what religion you are, buddy. I just want you to stop beating that guy to death. Ah, you see? Defending him. <laughs> that means you hate us. That's not true. I detest what you're doing in our name. Well, that's because you hate yourself. <laughs> Mate, this isn't about your religion. Just be reasonable, yeah? La la la! La la la! They're doing it again. Yeah, sorry guys. Uh, if you criticize him, you're anti his religion. So. But that's ridiculous. Like, it is a bit ridiculous, isn't it? Want me to tell everyone what you did to my grandparents again? He's right, you're wrong, move along. Oh, and both of you just lost your jobs. And you know, so it's really not much more complex than that. And a lot of like the, with the propaganda modem is just to like, throw in all these like random details and confusion and you know uh diversions to like uh essentially just confuse the masses um the but... surprising report from israel today right. how do you justify bombing a refugee yeah so there's the criminals here okay. are not hamas not even the israel right, so I just want to show you oh, this yeah, you so child deaths in Iraq, 3,114. Yeah, uh... I'm gonna play that again. And I would like to use the rest of my time to say how appalled I am that people are bringing up the Holocaust. Do not use other genocides to describe this one. I have been... I... Oh. <laughs> So there's a few you know, more on the first night of Passover, too. we asked these four questions and we said, why is this genocide different from all other genocides? 
subconscious, right? That's the subconscious, which is more often the most honest part of a human being, and it slips out, and that, there it is right there. And so in a 7-5 vote, the Democratic City Council is united to block that measure in Burlington, preventing Burlingtonians from registering their opinions on the issue. That really happened. Um, so yeah, there's like all the, you can find so many examples of this where like free speech is suppressed, people are prevented from talking about this, you know, and you said even yourself, like, uh, like you're pretty far detached from like, the mainstream, you know, influence or normie kind of propaganda or whatnot. But even you, somehow, someone was able to find his way to tell you that you shouldn't do this. Um, you know, so, so here, that's when people are afraid to even talk about something, then it, it's kind of a sign that they have, uh, you know, the inconvenient truth to hide and are hoping no one shines a light on it. Here's this guy, Censored Man. He made a compilation of Zionist Freudian slips. So they didn't, so here's just the first one we lead off with Justin Trudeau, and he almost says, We need a ceasefire, and then he catches himself because they can't be for a ceasefire. And so let's watch. We need to see a cease, uh, we need to see a, a humanitarian process <laughs> flow, uh, we need to see ceasing of, of, of the of violence for the scenes. Hey, we need more ceasing. Uh, it's fun to watch Justin Trudeau short out and turn into the Joe Biden of the North. Sorry, I had it on my really speed. Happened. So here's just the first one we lead off with Justin Trudeau. And so let's watch. We need to see a cease. Uh, we need to see a, a humanitarian <laughs> pause so we can flow. Uh, we need to see ceasing of, of, of the levels of violence that we've seen. We need, we need more ceasing. Uh, it's fun watching Justin Trudeau short out and turn into the Joe Biden of the North, isn't it? <laughs> they have the right to self-defense yeah. <laughs> and right to genocide now. So he was, like, he's just like, he doesn't even like, he just like stands there awkwardly, he doesn't even know what to do anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, since uh, October the 7th, uh, the focus uh, at the moment is uh, on the other side. Mm. Uh, people are trying to suggest that there is some sort of uh, moral equivalence. There is no moral equivalence. We are not the victims. So we are the victims. We are the victims. Sorry. I can tell you that we are not targeting anyone else in Gaza but civilians. Hamas is cynically, uh, but rather, but rather a uh, uh, terrorist. <laughs> that was a pretty good one too. We're not targeting anyone but civilians, and it's true, you know. Uh, yeah, let me see. I think there's a map here I had somewhere. Um, We've mapped the destruction, the bulk of the damage to date, where yeah. three quarters of the buildings have All been right, destroyed. Like from late October, we used satellite images to track the extent of damage to the end of January. So this is just like heat map of the buildings that were destroyed. Um, Up to then, about 55% of all buildings had been damaged or destroyed. That so like, you know, this is something that doesn't get talked about that much either, is like uh, the killing of all these people is, you know, really bad, of course, but the destruction of all the infrastructure, the schools, the universities, the hospitals, the, you know, centuries old buildings of art and institutions that define, you know, Palestinian history and what it is to be Palestinian, mm -hmm. like, that is who they are is like, you know, it, it, the people themselves too, but you know, they're defined by uh, their environment, their, their buildings, their architecture, their uh, schools and all, all of that. And so the deliberate destruction of all these things is like, you know, uh, they're, they, they say this too, like there was a minister of defense saying that um, we have to make Gaza uninhabitable by them, you know, cause they, it, it, you know, uh, one credit I will give Israel is like, I feel like they actually would rather not have to kill all Palestinians. They'd rather all the Palestinians just leave. Um, so there's less blood on their hands. But uh, so the, they're doing everything possible to try to make it as, as uninhabitable as possible for them. But the Palestinians are, you know, more resilient than any other group of people. And, you know, for them, it's like uh, they're no longer scared or anything like that because, you know, imagine you're a kid and you're born into this world you're born into a concentration camp you have no sort of hope mm -hmm. for the future you have no you know the only thing you know is that generations of families you know your friends or your own have been killed and these people on the other side of the wall are just raining down bombs on you you know 
when you're like that, it's actually very inspiring to see how they're able to, you know, stay positive and resilient and have hope after the level of destruction that there is. Um, you know, there's never, it's like unprecedented in history in terms of the amount of destruction in the shortest amount of time. Uh, you know, even if you compare like Dresden in World War II or anything else, it's like uh, there's no precedent for, you know, in terms of percentage of uh, that destruction. And it's hilarious, too, because they say like Hamas is entirely underground in the tunnels, yet they continue to bomb everything above ground. You know, uh, the, the logic like falls apart yeah, so easily. Themselves, yeah. yeah. And so actually there's a uh, on Twitter, too, I was seeing um, if you overlay the map of population density um it pretty much correlates exactly with how they've been bombing and um norman finkelstein he talks about uh this in some of his research where through like leaked israeli army reports and all these things like it's been shown that they have like sophisticated and they actually even say this themselves they brag about it that they have like sophisticated ai um, algorithms and surveillance to know exactly how many people are in what area and how they're moving and traveling and all of that. And so they even brag about that themselves. So you don't even need to like look at that. But the the re army reports basically say how they, you know, uh, they strategically deploy these bombs as like mowing the lawn, you know. So that's how they talk about it. They use that term mowing the lawn um, in Gaza and, you know, just like carpet bombing, proportional exactly to so it's very kind of like detached you know it's like an ai algorithm to perfectly place the bombs exactly where the population is most dense um and you know they then they tell the west that oh we're using like precision bombs and targeting only what's necessary and it's just like uh the civilian casualties are just like uh you know uh it's a unfortunate circumstance but we have no choice or but the reality is it's like a feature not a bug um there's like uh, i think 2000 pound 2000 pound which is like one of the biggest you get dumb bombs so unguided missiles just like giant 2000 pound 2000 pound grenade essentially flying from the sky and just being dropped in civilian areas you know th that's been documented and proven that they're doing that yet they say that we're only using guided missiles and then the the biggest problem is is like the western world or and especially the leaders in the western world they don't call that out. They actually, you know, launder all these lies and they repeat it for them. Like Joe Biden, for example, saying that he saw pictures himself of 40 beheaded babies um, and, you know, no such pictures existed. And Israel themselves took back that claim. Um, and so, you know, but once he said it, the damage is done, you know. So you have these Western politicians who are just, you know, lying uh, and laundering the lies of Israel uh, and all, their incentive to do that, too, is like, you know, Biden's biggest donor is APAC, the American Israeli uh, super PAC or lobbying group. Um, you know, so, of course, that's what he's going to say. He's just going to, you know, do whatever he like uh, they want him to say. Um, and so, you know, this I kind of want to like pivot to like <laughs> October 7th. <laughs> and here go. Oh yeah, that was one thing too. So, but okay, that was at that time. Like I was already calling it out, but now that enough time has passed, um, it's actually super interesting. If you look at Israeli media, Israeli media itself is actually more anti-Israel than Western media is. Um, and so, like most of Israel's propaganda efforts are directed at uh, the Western audience. Um, you know, for example, when they uh, they were raiding that hospital. They bombed that hospital and they were going to raid it. They were like carrying boxes with like giant bold letters that said medical supplies. You know, they speak Hebrew and the people in the hospital speak Arabic. Why would they write medical supplies on boxes in large English letters and do a photo shoot? That's to show for a Western audience, you know, oh, we're, we're just delivering aid. Um, but in fact, they were bombing like the flagship hospital of Gaza um, with this idea that this is like, the heartbeat of Hamas's operation and it's full of tunnels underneath and so they killed all these people in the hospital um like babies had to be pulled off their incubators and died uh like brand like newborn infants died because there was no they cut off all the electricity and they ran out of fuel from the generators so this hospital was under under siege for a week and then 
you know, those snipers taking out nurses from the windows. Uh, and then they raided the hospital to show everyone the tunnels. And turns out there's no tunnels. And then like everyone just moves on. And then it's like the, the their strategy is essentially like boiling the frog. They kind of gradually increase the intensity of atrocities and just do like all this brazen stuff that's like just, you know, a little bit worse than the last. And then it desensitizes people to what's going on. So, you know, when the hospital siege was happening, a lot of people were talking about it like, oh, damn, they're bombing a hospital. It was actually in the news. Uh, and then so they went in there. You know, uh, it's funny that even Fox News, who's like super conservative, pro-Israel, there's a video of him like getting the tour from the IDF on the tunnels underneath the hospital. And then like the the news anchor says like, uh, are these the tunnels? This just looks like a room of the hospital. Why is there the same tiles in the hospital as there is under the tunnels? And then the IDF guy says like, oh yeah, it, it, it's because we built these tunnels, you know, like 30 years ago uh, when we were like whatever, doing something in this hospital. And it's actually true. The only tunnels they showed were the ones that they built like, you know, a decade before in that hospital. Uh, and there was no actual like Hamas operation. So, um, and similar thing goes with October 7th. Like the majority of people, I think why they in their heads justify this is okay or they think whatever it's it's right because they uh, have this narrative in their head that Hamas, you know, raped people and burnt their bodies and, you know, beheaded kids and all these things um, on, on October 7th. And if you the just compile the, the what? The beheaded babies, that's like the, the most often repeated thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the when you look at all the evidence that's there, um, all the atrocities that they were talking about, and the Israel defense minister says this himself, like, he was like, oh, we originally thought there was 1,400 dead on that day. It was actually 1,200. Um, actual number, I think, is 1,139. Um, out of those 1,139, I think, like, uh, half of them were civilians, half of them were military. Uh, out of all of them, only one was a baby, and it was killed through crossfire while being held in his mother's arms, not beheaded. And all when they said like all these bodies were burnt um, and all this, those were actually because the Israeli helicopters were shooting the Hellfire missiles at the festival crowd uh, because of what Israel calls the Hannibal Directive. So the Hannibal Directive is essentially uh, Israel would rather kill its own civilians then that civilian end up as a hostage for Hamas because that gives Hamas bargaining power. And so uh, they, and, and there's also like the videos of people, um, you know, talking about that too. But many of the Israeli citizens from those kibbutz that were there at the time of the attack have said that the tanks fired on the house that had Hamas and the hostages. And so the reason they counted the number from 1,400 to 1,200 is because the Hamas bodies were burnt and charred so badly, along with the civilian bodies that were burnt and charred so badly, they couldn't tell the difference that it was like an Israeli citizen or a Hamas, you know, uh, fighter. So, um, and they admitted to all this publicly. And it, it, it's funny because when you say that there's a Hamas fighter burnt right beside an Israeli fighter or an Israeli citizen that's burnt, you're basically admitting that Israel like, or the IDF is the one that killed them because like, Hamas didn't right. burn the civilian and then he got hit by the IDF. Uh, it's clear that the, the civilians themselves on October 7th were killed by Israel. So, you know, even if your outrage is over atrocities committed on October 7th, uh, if you look at the evidence, all the evidence points to like Israel, you know, having killed a lot of those civilians. And, you know, I'm not denying that maybe there are people from the Palestinian side that did go over there and, you know, do things that were uh like not acceptable morally or whatever uh but there's the the evidence for that isn't like presented and the the reason any of that happened even was because for 6 hours there was no response from the IDF and that's like even Hamas themselves were confused like they never expected to be like having invaded for that long and getting away with it for that long. So they didn't even know what to do. And there's other like non Hamas, like there's, and, and this is the thing about Hamas too is Hamas isn't just like one organization. It's more of an ideology. There's many different like groups, you know, within that. 
uh, and you know, there's Palestinian Islamic Jihad, there's all these and civilians too. So there's Palestinian civilians, you know, that go over there too, and you know, are, are doing stuff. So it, there is a lot of chaos because you know the there was no response from the IDF for for six hours, and the when they did respond, they responded with just basically. Um, you know, they they had no strategy because, and this is the thing with the IDF too, is like, they say they're like the best military in the world. But if you look at everything happening now and on, on there, it's like, you can tell that they're just trained to like draw bombs from a computer, not any actual like ground warfare. And so their only solution was to just drop bombs and blow people up, including their own civilians on that day too. Um, and, you know, in, in the ground offensive in Gaza, that's been shown too, like they're, you know that's been a complete failure for them like they haven't made a dent at all uh and they've lost like a lot of you know idf personnel too in that um, but yeah so here this is israeli media um like going over the claims on october 7th so this isn't even like you know this is directly from israel in their news channels תראו את הדברים, הדברים הבאים שאומר סמכת חטיבת כפיר בערוץ 14, שימו לב. אנחנו מגיעים לקיבוץ בארי, ושם את עושה... אני אגיד את זה גם, כי זה... רק בשביל הדברים האלה. אנחנו מגיעים לקיבוץ בארי, ושם אני מתכוון שתי דברים של הבטל. אפרופו של האנימי ברטליטי, אחד זה נרסטרי שקול עם אינסטרי ילדים. חוץ מתום, אין שם שום דבר אחר. They were butchered, killed. You see the children inside the house? Ask the correspondent. Eight babies, eight babies are dead. As when I saw Jenya, may she rest in peace, an elderly woman from Kibbutz Beri. I see a number engraved on her arm, and you say she went through the Holocaust, Auschwitz, and in the end died in this Kibbutz. That's not something you can't even understand it. So that, that was like the statement made by the IDF personnel on like what he witnessed there. So then the news correspondent is now responding to that saying um, no eight babies were killed in Barry according to the kibbutz spokesperson and there's no woman named Jenya in Barry so you know all that stuff he said was just like complete fabrication it's like uh, you know just making something look as bad as possible and you can sp see specifically like they find every opportunity to try to inject the holocaust you know like this made-up woman who had like the auschwitz like serial number on her arm <laughs> yeah you know uh so yeah, here's another example yeah yeah and it's funny too it's always like 40 babies and like 95 it's like all very nice round numbers you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so here's another like guy uh talking um being interviewed There are also children here, babies, who are hanged on a laundry line, really, in one line. It's very hard to see. When I saw it, it shocked me. You don't really understand what you're seeing in front of your eyes. Is it a picture, or is it really reality? It's very, very hard to understand. So, he's talking about a supposed event in Kfar Aza. They made it clear long ago that this event simply didn't happen. By the way, he said the things. He was told that it didn't happen in a tour of foreign news journalists who came there and pay attention to what the police spokesperson said to the foreign media not long ago. Guys, the things that happen here are so sick. This is not a Netflix show and it's not a cable news show. None of that. No, this is real life. So, you know, these, uh, the IDF has like a department of like um, propaganda, essentially, and these narratives are kind of fed out there and they're never questioned, you know, because if you, if you even ask to question it, it's like you're anti-Semitic. So then this gets laundered through this series of like mainstream media and foreign press who are given these kind of propaganda tours and they say, they have this guy they bring and he says like, oh, I saw like babies on a you know clothing line hanged and you kind of uh they're trying to evoke a certain response um from you know the the journalist and then like uh, that journalist is not going to be like you know they're gonna be like oh that's so horrifying like they, 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 they they're not gonna be like show me proof yeah yeah because like a normal person you wouldn't even like 
you wouldn't even believe someone would lie something lie about something like that you know like they didn't even need to lie about anything but the and, and so this isn't a question and the these kind of propaganda narratives are pushed out to the west and people hear it and they make up their mind on you know oh palestinians they're just like savages that hate jews and commit these atrocities and you know uh they're baby murderers so i don't care if they you know uh get eliminated or you know they might like even on the like left-leaning more progressive side they think like oh yeah like palestinian civilians shouldn't die for what like hamas did but they still believe that hamas like did all these things on october 7th when you know there's no evidence for it uh and oh. even like israeli yeah Was and it? then this is the like the mainstream israeli media yeah yeah this is like so uh, channel 13 news and you know one of the like haaretz which is like one of the it's like the cnn of israel like they've published so many reports um saying a lot of these same things in terms of them killing their own civilians uh you know the made up stories about uh october 7th um and so it you know, let's finish this and I'll continue after that. So, so, so many terrible, cruel things happened. Some of the most cruel things that can be done as a human being on October. Mickey Rosenthal. Why were things said that didn't happen? And the other guy says, I assume to... So he's asking the other guy, like, why do you think they're lying about this stuff. He said, I assume in order to increase the magnitude of the hatred for Hamas, as if it's necessary to say what happened wasn't enough. But people are inventing events. And, you know, some, it's like some people aren't even necessarily malicious. It's like hear a rumor from someone and just repeat the rumor. And so it's like, you know, it's very easy to just seed like atrocities and people are just going to repeat it, you know, because uh, that's what gets people going. The war is not only militarily, it's also political and it's mainly media and most important part also to our Prime Minister. So it's necessary to say that they spread a story about putting a baby in an oven. So Zaka, so this is the thing, Zaka is this like far-right group that was essentially contracted by the government to do the recovery of the bodies on October 7th. So they were the ones responsible for recovering the bodies and, you know, uh, dealing with all Everything the damage. The yeah, so not the military. This was a private organization. And so this was the organization that kind of uh, staged these, like, photo ops. Um, this is in, like, Israeli newspapers that the, the, the report that they were using, like, dead bodies to stage like photo ops um, of like atrocities. And then they called in like, uh, f they were doing fundraising for their organization there too. They called in investors to like, look at what's happening and seeing that, oh, we're making such a big difference. So you should invest more money in us. Um, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's like, oh, people are just traumatized. So their like imagination is like making things up. So that's why they're telling these lies. Uh, so, you know, it's still that you, you can still see they're kind of trying to like brush it under the rug. Like, oh, it's like not their fault. They're just traumatized. So that's why they're making up stuff. Um, they don't have any implying as if it wasn't like bad intent. And, you know, maybe it wasn't bad intent from the people who heard it from someone else, but, you know, it's still like seeded uh, or the environments like created for that. Yeah. And then and this is the thing too, like Israel has historically so many times been caught in lies and they're never held accountable, you know, uh, there's this one time they literally just like killed a journalist, uh, like a CNN journalist, like in the head, like shot her in the head and denied that it happened. And then after all the evidence came out, they accepted that it happened. And then there was no like people just forgot about it. Um, and so, you know, that becomes super effective. But yeah, here's the guy. And this is like the, we had the number at official, uh, Israeli official. For casualties. And now we've revised that down to 1,200 because we understood Oops, the volume up. that we had overestimated we we made a mistake there were actually bodies that were so badly burnt we thought they were ours in the end apparently they were uh hamas terrorists what we're, what we're uh, when we make a mistake we admit it 
we had the number. Oh, this isn't the full clip, but he basically says that, oh, I could, we couldn't tell because they were mixed in with the bodies of the civilians as well in the full clip. Um, so, yeah, the uh, and this is a more recent thing, too, that to happened. Um, so people like denying that this sort of narrative and propaganda comes okay, from like the government okay. level. Israel. This the basically like IDF was forced to confess that they were operating one of the like biggest like propaganda telegram groups. So they're essentially like like a snuff channel posting like atrocities and like glorifying it uh, as like a telegram group. Another day, um, another hefty load of evidence for the Hague against. Just slow this down. So this is like you know more evidence in the case against them. Uh, the South Africa made for genocide. Um, Israel. The IDF. Yeah. Has been forced to admit that they have been running a propaganda channel on Telegram aimed at Israeli citizens that featured snuff films of Palestinians being murdered, dehumanized as insects and vermin, their bodies desecrated, and the destruction of Gaza glorified. Here are the details. The channel named 72 Virgins Uncensored celebrated everything from a Palestinian being repeatedly run over to a mother grieving over her son to the destruction of places of worship and reduction of Gaza City to rubble. The existence of the channel has been known for some time. It was created on October 9th. Haaretz was the first mainstream outlet to cover its existence in early December of last year. Now, in that first report, they were able to cite a senior military official who anonymously confirmed that the IDF was in fact directing the channel. At the time, however, the IDF denied those claims. Now, in a follow-up, the IDF has been forced to admit that their own propaganda unit was behind 72 virgins the whole time. Here is how Haaretz with that reporting, quote, reversing an earlier denial, Israeli military officials have admitted that the tele- Yeah, so Haaretz is one of the like top Israeli uh, like newspapers. Graham Channel 72 Virgins Uncensored was operated by members of the Department of the Israeli Defense Forces Operations Directorate. The admission comes after a Haaretz published an expose on the channel last month, which led to an internal investigation into the matter. The probe, conducted by Major General Oded Basiak, head of the Operations Directorate, found that the information that led to the original denial that the channel was operated by or on behalf of the Army was incorrect and relied on misinformation relayed by members of the influencing department. In the wake of these findings, the unit's wartime commander is to end his military service. So now the IDF claims that the influencing department was in fact running the channel, but they were just freelancing, doing so without authorization. You can make your own judgments about how accurate this new version of the story is. Haaretz also documented some of the genocidal language, gore, and war crimes that were celebrated on this channel. Quote, an October 11th post read, burning their mother, you won't believe the video we got. You can hear their bones crunch. We'll post it right away. Get ready. Photos of Palestinian men captured by the IDF in the strip and the bodies of what they describe as terrorists were captioned, exterminating the roaches, exterminating the Hamas rats, share this beauty. A video of a soldier allegedly dipping machine gun bullets in pork fat is captioned, what a man, greases bullets with lard, you won't get your virgins. Another caption was, garbage juice, another dead terrorist, you have to watch it with the sound, you'll die laughing. Analyst Knox Bilal has been tracking the content on the channel as well. According to Bilal, on 72 virgins, you could find this video of buildings in Gaza being demolished. Each time one is reduced to rubble, the twirling menorah on the screen gets another cap- candle. The caption reads, burn Gaza down. You can also find some of the images that horrified the world, but apparently delighted the Israeli audience of 72 virgins, men and young boys being detained and humiliated in Gaza. Here's what they apparently considered a hilarious post advertising a destroyed building as if it was luxury real estate. Gaza, six rooms, 360 degree view, spacious roof, street with lots of parking exclusively for sale. For those interested, a pool can be added. LOL. Many commentators have been shocked by the willingness of IDF soldiers to publish TikToks advertising their war crimes and atrocities to the world. Incredibly, the shock was often at their willingness to publish these crimes rather than the commission of the crimes themselves. But here we have the propaganda unit of the IDF itself running a snuff aggregation channel. It makes several things really quite clear. First, far from being ashamed of their war crimes, the IDF and the Israeli government want Jewish Israelis to know just how brutal they are actually being, how complete the destruction and annihilation and suffering After all, remember, the polls found only 1.8% of Israeli Jews thought the IDF were using too much firepower. Nearly 60% thought they were not using enough. So, like, that point is one of the scariest. Is like 60% of Israeli citizens believe that the IDF is not using enough force in Gaza. Even after this is, like, the most amount of force that's ever been used against the people. And so, you know, this, like it's it's one thing like a lot of people say like oh the problem will be solved once like netanyahu's like removed from the government it's just like the current israeli government is corrupt and they're right wing and like they're the problem but the israeli citizens don't want this but in fact like netanyahu wasn't as extreme as he is now he had to get more extreme to get more support from israeli civilians so uh and this is a the scary part about this is if you want to get away with this you have to 
not only dehumanize the people that you're trying to cleanse, but you have to dehumanize yourself too, that, you know, you can get people used to this and okay with this and, you know, uh, take the humanity out of people that they, they, they don't even see what's wrong with it. And in fact, they celebrate it. Um, so, you know, the, uh, there's examples of this too, where instead of like punishing the person who did it, that person was awarded a medal. So it's like very encouraged and kind of, uh, celebrated to, you know, talk about Palestinians in this like really horrific way. And it's very reminiscent of how Jews were talked about in, in Nazi Germany, you know, as like vermin that needed to be destroyed. And, you know, the, the glorification of like hearing their bones crunch, like that's not, you know, self-defense. That's not, you know, uh, trying to get rid of Hamas, you know, uh, it says, I can't actually accomplish any of their supposed military objectives. Brutality is meant to substitute for success. After all, Hamas is not destroyed. The IDF has killed more of their own hostages than they have rescued. The tunnel system is largely intact and far from creating a shock in the population that would lead them to abandon their fight. The Israelis have only strengthened the logic of violent resistance among Palestinians. Domestically, Israel is suffering a tremendous economic blow and inching closer to outright global pariah status, having already been found to be plausibly committing genocide. Even the pathetic and genocide abetting Biden administration, alongside the pathetic and genocide abetting Sunak UK government, are considering unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state. Hamas is likely strengthened, and the security of the Israeli people has only been further compromised. So gore, horror, and incitement to genocide are proffered as a way to cover for the abject systematic failure to accomplish any of the supposed goals of this operation. The IDF atrocity TikToks are not a bug, but a feature of this system. Not just allowed, but encouraged. After all, this entire 72 Virgins channel was sustained and populated with multiple posts daily, including confidential operational details, for months by the very unit dedicated to putting out the version of the war and the messaging on the war that the official powers that be want to see propagated. I'm reminded of Harat's recent report from the ethnic cleansing conference just held in Israel intended by more than a dozen government ministers. According to their journalists there on the ground, the most rapturous response was reserved for exactly this type of content. Quote, the biggest response came for videos of soldiers in Gaza calling for the strip to be resettled, shouting out that there are no innocents or photographing themselves with banners for the Katif block that is the former settlements in the Gaza Strip. So stop being puzzled by the mystery of IDF soldiers filming their atrocities. These same TikToks, which spark revulsion around the globe, are met with awe and admiration by the domestic population on whom Netanyahu and co depend on for their grip on power. The soldiers committing those crimes, they're celebrated as heroes. Now, it is cold comfort for the Palestinians who are being subjected to torture, starvation, mass killings, and complete annihilation of their civil society. But every one of these incidents makes it that much more difficult for the Israeli government to wriggle their way out of those ICJ genocide charges. How can you argue that Bibi's calls to destroy Amalek or President Herzog's declaration that there are no innocent civilians or Defense Secretary Gallant's comment that they are fighting human animals be taken as anything other than official government policy when the IDF is running a channel to glorify actions entirely consistent with these genocidal comments? How can you possibly view these comments and actions as fringe when they're being pushed as the official face of the war by the IDF propaganda unit? The genocide... Yeah, so, you know... Exactly, yeah. And it's... So, you know... And this is the, at the end of the day, the people are human and the humanity will still shine through. And I think there's been a lot of people, you know, there's so many videos now of IDF soldiers themselves kind of blowing the whistle on all the shit they had to do. You know, um, there's one guy who like came on uh, like live stream, he was just like watching it and he's like a former IDF soldier and he was just talking with the guy and he was saying how like they would take like Valium and Xanax and cocaine to like numb their senses so that they can, you know, go around, you know, murdering families w without it, you know, uh, affecting them. Cause it's like not psychologically normal for a human being to like go through that. And, you know, uh, him, like his process of actually, um, you know, sitting back and like seeing that, you know, maybe we aren't the good guys in this situation. Uh, and so it's, it's a slow process, but, you know, I think due in large part to the internet, a lot of people are coming to know the truth, but I think it's not fast enough. Um, the, the, be the biggest impact would be if like more American citizens and like Jewish citizens, uh, either in Israel or anywhere else, like can distance themselves from, you know, pro-Israel because this is what pro-Israel is you know like you can this is a 
officially there's like all this evidence linking you know this is that that's their official policy so if you were pro israel you're saying you're pro all these things you know um yeah, and just supporting. I, I get it though but in terms of like they're pro israel in terms of they want israel to continue to exist as a country um and if that's your goal then going then calling out all the terrible stuff that israel is doing now is the best thing you can do to m- make sure that happens because the biggest existential threat to Israel right now is, the, you know, the government and the IDF and their uh, operation that they're doing. They're making a lot of enemies in, in the entire world and, you know, delegitimizing the the state itself, you know. Uh, there's nothing that brings more, like, uh, illegitimacy to its sort of right as a state to exist than, you know, committing all these crimes uh, and, you know, yeah, so, by refusing right, to like, discuss, the show the act- occupation, or even allow yeah, so, the Palestinians. But it, it, the reason it's so hard for so many Jews to like refusing- come to terms with this, it's like the huge cognitive dissonance because everything they're taught from the moment, like their kids, like growing up, is like the Israeli viewpoint. So like this is the I never found like my the people. birthright never trips found my place. Um, and finally I, I landed I found my friends and being here in Israel is just it's a life changing but... experience to finally land where I was supposed to be always the people the experiences and just like the, the joy that we had on this trip I I'm gonna cry it's like I've never had such a meaningful yet fun experience in my entire life ever. founded in 1994 by Charles Bronfman and Michael Steinhardt in cooperation with the Israeli government birthright Israel or simply birthright is a free 10 day heritage trip to Israel Jerusalem and the Golan Heights for young adults of Jewish heritage between the ages of 18 and 26. The purpose being to strengthen diaspora Jews' connection to Israel and increase a sense of Jewish identity. But can a free trip really be free? So, and so they have this, and like, uh, there's been people like Jew- Jews that went on that trip and like asked to meet with Palestinians or asked about Palestine, and they're essentially like censored or like, you know, told that they can't do that. And so it was like very controlled, like propaganda setup. And um, the birthright is one thing, but they're always like inviting celebrities and stuff too. Like, uh, um, what's his name? That one Asian comedian guy. He's on Joe Rogan a lot of the time too. But he was saying how he was invited by Israel for like uh, all expenses, like trip there. Um, and you know, all these other like celebrities were going to be there and they're going to do this whole tour. And like when he got there and then he was told like, Oh, like every day you have to send like a tweet saying something good about Israel. You know, uh, and they, he says like they didn't mention that to me before the trip, and you know the, uh, so it, it it's very kind of deeply embedded in like Western like pop culture and media and like uh, you know the identity of like Jewish people both in the West and in Israel and like you know all around the world. Uh, you you give them this sort of experience, and then you say like, oh, these people hate us and they want to take this away from us you know it, you're able to convince a lot of people um to go along with whatever they want 